We went to the Game Developers Conference because we were nominated for the IGF. That show was the first time that I realized that people actually knew about our game. They were like, hey, I know Necrodancing, I played it at PAX, or I played it at IndieCade. So it was neat to see that, you know, all this festival hopping that we'd been doing was, was paying off. I was inspired by Spelunky. I really loved the fact that when you died in Spelunky, it was never some random thing that happened in the game that killed you. I still was a fan of the old school kind of top-down dungeon games, so I thought I would make a hybrid, keep the turns, but have them be quick. And when I tried doing that, it was a lot of fun, but it also felt like I was moving to the beat of something. So I tried playing it with Thriller by Michael Jackson as the music, and uh, it just felt great. Well, I'm lucky that I live here in Vancouver and there's so many other cool uh, talented game designers around that I can show my prototypes to and get their feedback. And originally I had it so that the player would move on the beat and the enemies would move on a half beat. And I did that so that it would be like really predictable so you could tell like, oh, I go, then they do, then I go, then they do. Matt Thorson, who made Towerfall, suggested that I should make it so that you and the enemies all move on the beat. That way the whole world feels like it's synchronized to the beat more. He's definitely right, but it was a bit confusing at first. I had to iterate quite a lot to make it obvious that you're moving, but then the enemies are moving like immediately after you. It felt a lot more compelling, like you were really in the music. And also originally we had it so that the amount of leeway that you had from one beat to the next was really low. Well, I originally made it so you can only have about 20% leeway to, to correctly hit the key. Because I thought, oh, this is a rhythm game, I should make the accuracy important. But it actually felt best when I increased the leeway because the times when you're furthest from the beat are the times when you're most stressed. Like when a red dragon busts through the wall and is about to shoot a fireball at you, you're trying to think, like, what should I do now? And your brain is you know, lagging a little bit, you're actually taking maybe 200 to 300 milliseconds. And if you miss the beat right then, you'd be like, oh, why did the game do this to me? I didn't miss the beat, I thought I was on the beat. So it actually felt best when I made that leeway 100%. Yeah, with that, plus Matt's idea, it felt ready and then we just needed like to flesh it out more. The name Necrodancer just uh, came to me. And so once we had that, it's this guy, the Necrodancer, it's his crypt, so who is he? and why is the protagonist having to move to the beat? Working with Ryan is awesome. Um, he has a ton of experience. I think he's released like nine or 10 games in the last 10 years, which is incredible. We always kind of do our own thing first. Like he, he you know, trusts us to, to do our thing. Usually how it works is Ryan goes through and programs what he thinks will be fun gameplay with kind of placeholder art. And then I go through and redraw what I think the, the enemies should look like. Sometimes Jesse Turner, he'll make really awesome character concept art. And so sometimes that comes first. It sounds like a meme, but I'm like, try this one, Ted, because <laughs> Ted's so good, and I make these over-designed things, and a lot of people are like, don't believe it'll happen. Like, when, when I post the concepts, I'm like, hey, here's the concept for this boss. They're like, how is this in a pixel art? And I'll send it Ted stuff, and they're like, oh, like, they're just surprised. My favorite concept that I made, I think, actually, is Dead Ringer. He's like this tangle of, like, a, like a French horn if it was, like, smashed onto somebody and you just, like, had to live through it. It was getting pretty grim. That, that, I, I have that problem, too, of getting things a little bit too, like, but it's still silly, but it's, like, really kind of dark. Luckily, Necrodancer's uh, theme is kind of silly and kind of weird. All bets are off, right? Because there's a mobile sunglasses on. It's, it's been, like, easy for me to play in there. One of my friends called it Spook House Rock. I think that's like the best descriptor possible. With a game with music such a core element, it only makes sense that the composer is going to have a little more input. Like the uh, singer shopkeeper we came up with um, one time when we were, Brian was over here and we were jamming on the game. I didn't think it would be such a thing. I just thought it would be like a funny thing. A few people noticed. You know, I didn't think someone would make a 10 hour loop of it on YouTube. Yeah, it's kind of cool to see how that's taken off. 
<laughs> you know, I, I had thought from the from the get-go that like the really end game stuff would be just super fast, crazy drum and bass stuff. The reality of it is if it's too fast, it's just not really playable. The enemies and stuff are gonna be tougher too. It's definitely a, a restriction I hadn't really had before. Part of the challenge Necro Dancer was trying to learn about all these different genres of dance music and try to just at least at least touch on them. Buddy Jules, who goes by Family Jules, 7X. He sent me metal versions of all the Zone 1 music. Ryan is very open ideas and open-minded, and so we decided Jules would just go through and do metal versions of all the tracks. So when you play as Aria, you're gonna be listening to a heavy metal version of the entire uh, game soundtrack. I thought, what would complete the trifecta was Alex Esquivel, goes by A-Rival. A-Rival is going to be doing an entire cover album that you'll play through as Melody. So pretty pumped to be uh, having those two guys as part of the game. So I do the majority of the voices for the characters in the game. The of the skeletons and, you know, the of death metal. Necrodancer is kind of particularly challenging because the sound effects are all very short. Normally, it might be like a door opening, which would like, yeah. But for Necrodancer, it's gotta be percussive. So it's like, Doof. and it's not typically what a door sounds like when you open it, but for Necrodancer, it's, it's perfect. King Konga. King Konga went through probably three, four iterations before we were happy with the sound. It was an actual monkey, like from a sound effects library for a while. We're like, this isn't, this isn't nearly intense enough. This isn't gonna rip your face off. So I got on the mic at like two in the morning one night. I was just so tired. I'm like, you know what? Just do it. And I just raged like actual King Kong. <laughs> yeah, that's, it turned out really well. <laughs> and Ryan's shocked us even me. So yeah. that's a good sign. I think my favorite thing in Necrodancer audio wise would be on consecutive hits, Cadence will ramp up her attack sound. So like, huh, yeah, ha, ha. And when you have that, that final hit on a dragon and take him out and go, yeah, afterwards, it just feels so good. When, and when Elspeth got in there, it was just, it was amazing. With Cadence, the direction mostly was uh, lower, lower your voice and really, really get into like your inner, your inner badass. And just imagine that you're fighting dragons and, and just trying to stay alive, but at the same time realizing that you can do it and that you are super strong. But I came here with a question, and I'm gonna find the answer if it kills me. It was the first time I'd actually really done something uh, that involved a lot of grunting and uh, melee and death noises. I was doing everything in my closet, but apparently I hadn't soundproofed it all the way. My neighbors would hear the death sounds and they would come up and uh, one time they actually brought me cookies because they thought I was they thought I was like like in a really bad argument or something. They're like, are you all right? I'm like, it's good. I'm fine. We're cool. Our player base is amazing. They're really friendly. They're receptive. They talk to you about what's going on with the game. Even when there's a bug or something, they're always like, and this game is the best game. And, and like, you know, I want to tell all my friends about it. It's just a really nice community. Early access has helped out a lot. I can't necessarily keep in, keep in mind all of the possibilities that could happen with one item. Like, there's an enemy called a ghast, so that when you hit it from one direction, it's supposed to teleport to the, the opposite direction of you. But there's also things in the game, like there's a, a bomb, for example, which you could hit a ghast with, and it wouldn't have any direction. It would just kind of explode right on top of it, and it wouldn't know where to teleport. So there's a bug for a while where the ghast would think, uh, OK, I didn't get hit from any direction, so I'll just teleport right on top of the player and hit them right away. So it's nice to have people that are streaming, playing a lot, and finding these things, pointing them out to us. 
I like the uh, the racing. They have a Crypto the Necrodancer racing league called Condor. So that's fun watching people that are way better than me at the game. The forum is, is really interesting if we are doing open development and we're posting the things that we make as we make them onto the forum. Yeah, I remember when I, I, I posted the tar monster and it, it's kind of brown colored and one guy called it an excremental, like an elemental, like a poop elemental. He's more purple now uh, than brown. So it's good, good feedback, important feedback. We also get a lot of fan art throughout the day. It's kind of surreal to have people like take this weird stuff that we've done and, and take it seriously and give it, give it life. One of those pieces of fan art was a skin for Bard, for, for Necrodancer, for me personally. And they put all these things on my character for the default image based off the PowerUpAudio.com team photo. At that moment, that was one of the highlights of my career. I think people don't know how much work goes into it, but we're okay with that because we love working on it so much. At the time, I didn't really know what I was getting into, and it's just become this amazing, amazing thing, and I'm just so proud to be a part of it. Yeah, but it's the best. I wouldn't trade for anything. Working with people this skilled, are you kidding me? It's like the funnest and easiest thing to do in the world.